Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, it's, <laughs> it's such an honor to be here today. And especially, you know, after three long years from the last celebration in Chicago. And the best part is that we can finally talk about the Mandalorian. So, <laughs> yeah. So today, um, I want to share with you sort of some of the design challenges that we faced in designing the Mandalorian, how we overcame tight budgets, short schedules, and high expectations. I'll share how we designed about 24 episodes. That's over 960 minutes of content. That's the equivalent of seven feature films in four years. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And I'll also highlight um, key character designs, like Grogu, Baby Yoda, <laughs> and the Mandalorian. And, and I'll talk about spaceship designs. And at the very end, I'll leave about 20 minutes, hopefully, for some questions. So to get started, this year marks my 18th year designing for Star Wars. <laughs> Seven of those were working directly with George Lucas. Many of us in the Lucasfilm Art Department grew up with the original trilogy. For us, Ralph McQuarrie and Joe Johnston were our design heroes. Ralph had this amazing sensibility that was Star Wars. And Star Wars design was Ralph. Ralph could express so much with just a few strokes. These pencil sketches are still some of my favorites. And that's because each one is a frame that I want to see in a movie. In designing The Mandalorian, we wanted to capture that essence that Ralph did so well. And from Joe Johnston, we wanted to capture his iconic designs, his simple, memorable designs, their classic Star Wars designs. So Ralph and Joe's work would make up the first half of our design philosophy for The Mandalorian. In my seven years working at Skywalker Ranch with George would make up that second half. For The Mandalorian, we wanted to merge the aesthetics of the prequels with the original trilogy and treat it as one cohesive universe, as George has always intended. It was important to us that the designs drew on the forum language that George firmly established. Now, after nearly two decades of designing for Star Wars, I'm often asked if I ever get tired of it. And the short answer is, of course, no. There are still so many new characters and worlds to develop. When I first started working with George in 1995, the world of Star Wars was just opening up for me. The playground was vast, and the boundaries were limitless, and it was super exciting. Flash forward to the summer of 2017, and I got that exact same feeling again. When John and Dave teamed up to create The Mandalorian, the Star Wars playground opened up once more. I've been wanting to work with John and Dave for years, so I immediately started doing some paintings, even though I had no idea what they were planning. This is one of my first paintings for The Mandalorian, and it was inspired by Ralph McQuarrie's painting of the sort of the original Boba Fett when he was in white. Dave also began drawing dozens of sketches to help guide us. Both John and Dave are very accomplished artists. John would often sketch along with Dave. Working with filmmakers who can draw really well makes a huge difference <laughs> in the design process because it allowed us to design faster because we had a visual shorthand. With the combined forces of both John and Dave, the idea of the Mandalorian started to take shape and become a reality. This sketch from Dave finally clinched it for Disney. This single image conveyed the essence of the story, the mystery, and the drama. Like Ralph's work, Dave's sketches are iconic. They're images that I want to see in a movie. And then here's Ryan Church's finished painting of that moment. <laughs> With Disney's approval, we quickly realized that what John and Dave was planning, the story that they were doing was vast. It was, it was far more than a feature film's worth. And to tell the story, John and Dave felt that the longer format of a live action series would be, that, you know, would be the best. But we've never done a live action Star Wars TV show before. George Lucas actually explored that idea in the late 2000s. But his vision was huge. It was so big it would have been super expensive because the technology wasn't ready. But now, almost 10 years later, the timing seemed right. However, in order to pull it off, it would demand innovation in all aspects of the filmmaking process, including design. We want to achieve theatrical quality for TV on an unparalleled level. 
And John Favreau took on that challenge. <laughs> like George, John is an innovative filmmaker. <laughs> Coming off of his successes of The Jungle Book and his innovation of virtual filmmaking tools for The Lion King, John was indeed the filmmaker to lead that charge. Over the holidays of 2017, he surprised everybody and wrote two scripts. On January 8, 2018, we started designing. I gathered a small team of artists, Ryan Church, Eric Tiemens, Christian Osman and Brian Matthias. <laughs> Over the next four months, more artists would join the team to sort of help John's writing. As John wrote, the art inspired his writing, and likewise, the art inspired his process as well. And this mirrored my process working with George back in 1995. That team would eventually grow to over 18 artists, including sculptors, practical modelers, and CG modelers. This was a really highly seasoned team of Star Wars artists, the best that I could gather. Most of us have worked together for years. Now here's a fun fact. We created over 4,000 designs per season per show. And this was despite the fact that the concept team was about half the size of a typical feature film. We were designing not only sets and environments, but also vehicles, ships, costumes, characters, creatures, props, hair and makeup, and visual effects. That's over 12,000 concepts for three seasons. Almost all of the art that you see in the end credits were created in the first four months of our 21-month production schedule. So let's talk about Mandalorian design. What makes a Mandalorian design? We follow the guidelines set by George. Keep it simple. Design as if a child could draw it. Design for the silhouette. Design for the iconic logo. People often perceive shapes first, so it's critical that they understand what they're looking at very quickly. So the silhouette is key. Next comes color and detail. Both of those complete the design, but don't define it. Star Wars design, in many ways, is like archaeology. You're digging into the past to uncover ideas and make them your own. We never design in a vacuum. We always use research to ground the designs. These guidelines from George are easy to understand. <laughs> Thank you. And they're easy to understand, and, but really hard to do well. In fact, I'm still learning it after 18 years. One of the key aspects of Star Wars design is that George insisted that it should not look designed. Now that's a really curious statement, considering that everything in Star Wars needs to be designed, from door handles to entire planets. This is perhaps the most important aspect of Star Wars design, and the one that is most often misunderstood. Here's a quote from George that explains it. He said, I don't want anything to stand out. I want to make everything look casual, natural, almost the I've seen it before look. I don't want any costumes, any sets, anything in the movie to stand out. The design should look familiar, but not familiar at the same time. Nothing should match. To do this, one of the guidelines I use is to keep 80% of it grounded in reality. To give it a foundation in the real world, that 80% makes it authentic. The next 20% is what makes it Star Wars. For example, using a Gothic church as the foundation for the Naboo hangar. That 20% can be invented. It can be mixing old with new, changing scale, blending different eras or cultures. Again, it's very easy to say, but really hard to do right. As we started to design The Mandalorian, we were tasked with designing two and a half films worth of content for each season with only half the budget and a third the time. This was my first time designing for a TV show, and it was tough. <laughs> the restrictions of a smaller budget and reduced schedules were really challenging. But Orson Welles once said, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. In art, the amount of time you spend on a piece doesn't determine how good it is. Often the opposite is true. There is a law of diminishing returns. The quality of art plateaus. So we decided to embrace the limitations and use them for our advantage. This, of course, creates tremendous compromises and stress on the team. But the shorter schedule actually allowed us to be more efficient, make quicker decisions, and not overthink. In order to do that, we had to invent new design workflows, like using VR tools to scout sets virtually. 
And, you know, that allowed us to make decisions on staging and designs, often months before construction. And I was very fortunate to collaborate with my amazing production design partner, Andrew Jones. <laughs> yes. Andrew spent years developing these techniques with John Favreau on The Jungle Book and with James Cameron on Avatar. These new tools allowed us to design efficiently and effectively. So we typically start designing about 31 weeks, or about seven months from our filming date. Once the filming date is set, the clock starts ticking, and it becomes a race. This gives us about four months to design the entire show, and then another three to fine tune as the scripts are finalized. The reality, however, is that the design process never really ends. It continues long after we finish filming into post-production and editing. So let's talk about specific designs now for the memory. One of our first assignments was the Razor Crest. The, the brief that we got, the brief that we got from John Favreau was to make it a workhorse spaceship with two powerful engines. He asked us to reference the A-10 Warthog. I've always loved the Warthog because I think it's a funky design, but it's practical and it's a great inspiration for a Star Wars ship. And as I was putting this presentation together, I was surprised how quickly we landed on this design in about two weeks. Normally, spaceship designs take a long time, and I was shocked to find so few drawings. By contrast, for example, in Rogue One, we chased the Ewing for over six months in over 780 drawings. <laughs> These are some of Ryan Church's first ideas for the Razor Crest, and they were super cool, but the silhouette didn't have the clarity that we wanted. But this one did, and we all knew right away this was the winner. In design, sometimes you get lucky, and you get that immediate emotional reaction that it just feels right, and this was one of those cases. The design is iconic, it's simple, easy to draw, and it's memorable. And John liked the powerful, no-nonsense aesthetic, and it matches Mando's personality really well. It looks like a spaceship that he would fly. So we refined the initial design further by rounding the nose to give it a retro quality. The blunt nose also mirrored his helmet design, which gave it a lot of personality. And then we gave it a shiny metal finish to, mask, to match his Beskar armor. And this was really fun because it reminded me of the Chrome Naboo ships, and I like to mix old and new. And here's the Razor Crescent in early keyframe painting. We often present designs and keyframes to allow John a chance to evaluate them in the context of the film, how they'll be seen in the shot, to find out if they're working cinematically. And that's really critical because the designs have to work cinematically. That's why we do most of our designs and present them as keyframes. Here's our final Razor Crest model. This phase of the refinement takes weeks to do because it's important to work out all the details. How the landing gears work, how the doors close, how long the ramp should be. Sometimes things look great in artwork, but don't translate well practically into the real world. Ramps are really challenging. It's a running joke in that our first ramps are almost always too steep. I mean, what looks good in, <laughs> what looks good in our work is are often unwalkable. Like even 20 degrees is hard to walk and the ramps quickly become a slide. <laughs> so with the 3D model finished, we can test different lighting conditions and textures to see how it looks in different environments. Like in a desert, in harsh sunlight, or in a forest with filtered light. We want to make sure it looks good in a variety of environments and adjust the material as necessary. This gives us the opportunity to solve issues early on before we actually commit to construction. Now, this is one of my favorite paintings from Ralph McQuarrie. It's from A New Hope <laughs> of the Millennium Falcon on Tatooine. I've been trying forever to try to recreate this scene, and we finally got a chance with the Razor Crest in Pelly's hangar. And here's that keyframe of that painting. <laughs> This painting just made me really happy to see Ralph's painting reimagined this way for the Mandalorian. So let's talk about the costume design for the Mandalorian himself. We knew that our hero Mando would have to be iconic, but how do we distinguish him from Boba Fett? This was way before we knew that there was gonna be any other Mandalorian, and all the Mandalorians at this time was either Boba Fett or Jango Fett. So Dave kicked us off by sketching some initial ideas on the right. The left images is an early image from Ralph McQuarrie of Boba Fett, and the right images are um, Dave's. To the casual fan, our Mando could easily be mistaken for Boba because the details are very similar. So we focused on changing the silhouette to differentiate him. We gave him a longer cape, a distinct pulse rifle. The ambient pulse rifle, ironically, was first seen in Boba Fett in the 1978 holiday special. <laughs> yeah. 
But since we thought no one saw that special, it, it would be okay to give it to Mando. <laughs> Uh, these early paintings from Brian Mantius combine these sketches to create our signature Mando silhouette. And here's the final design. In addition to the longer cape, the pulse rifle was critical. We discovered that the angle of how he wore it was critical to his silhouette. A bit too vertical or too horizontal completely changed the character's personality. And even the length of the rifle was important. And here's a diagram that shows his armor is made up of mix and match pieces from his previous bounties. This chart shows where some of those parts might have come from. His shoulder pauldrons, for example, and his shin guards came from a short trooper. And the dust trooper provided his codpiece. His helmet and the Beskar van brace, however, were custom to him. So here are the stages of his armor in season one. This is how we saw him in the beginning. And then in stage two, his very first new piece of armor, his Beskar pauldron. And then stage three, after he was beaten up by the Mudhorn. <laughs> and then stage four, after he repaired himself. And then finally stage five. <laughs> this is, of course, the Mando that we know now and love. While we were developing Mando's costume, we were also thinking about his character. Uh, and we referenced great buddy films like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and used it as a framework for Mando and IG-11's relationship. And this is an early concept showing that relationship. We deliberately mirrored that moment from Butch Cassidy and Sundance in their last standoff. Baby Yoda. <laughs> Let's talk about Grogu. This was our trickiest and rickiest, Ricky, Ricky, Rick, Rickiest design, sorry. And we spent the most time developing him, about four to five weeks. Inspired by the Japanese film Lone Wolf and Cub, Dave kicked us off with these sketches of a little Yoda-like creature. And we had to walk this very fine line of not going too cute. And yet, we wanted to create a character that fans would love. This was our first pass. <laughs> We translated David's sketches literally, but it didn't capture the cuteness that John was looking for. So we started exploring character expressions to see if we could find the right level of charm and personality to define his character design. We also took a pass <laughs> to make him look more like a gnome, but it wasn't quite working. And finally, we came back to something that was more Yoda-like. This seemed to be the direction that worked the best. We were all circling something, and we knew we were in the zone, but none of these were hitting the perfect note for John. And John kept describing him as ugly cute, something that's not designed to be cute. And it turned out that the eyes were the key. John wanted them to be dog-like, with giant dark pupils. And not human-like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When they're human eyes, where you can see the white color of his eyes, it gets very strange very fast. <laughs> and this is really curious because Yoda has human eyes, and it looks great for him. But oddly, when we gave Grogu human eyes, he just looked creepy and psychotic. <laughs> and then finally, Christian Osmond cracked it with these designs. Like a puppy dog, there's just enough white in his eyes visible to make him look adorable. Seeing that tiny bit of white gave his eyes a very charming, sympathetic look. Then dressing him in this oversized sack completely captured that ugly, cute factor. <laughs> yes. Yay. Yeah. As you can see, there is incredible charm in his eyes and his pouty mouth with a slight overbite. Taken individually, these features are not cute by themselves but together, it's an adorable combination. And in case you're curious, this is what he looks like underneath. <laughs> okay, moving on. So, okay, for season one for the Mud Planet, we wanted to bring back the blurbs from the Ewok when we battle for Endor. <laughs> yes. Phil Tippett's original design was really fun and whimsical and really cool. But, you know, that's because they look like giant Muppet monsters, which gave them a lot of personality. I really liked the weird tadpole body and the wide mouth and the giant elephant legs. It had a lot of quirky charm that made it a really great Star Wars creature. In bringing the Blurk back into our world, though, we were worried at first 
that the original designs might not work for today's more sophisticated audience. So we decided to update the design to make it more believable. This is our early pass with more realistic proportions. But as you can see, ironically, by making it more realistic, we lost the whimsy that made the original so successful. So we decided to return back to the original proportions by shortening the midsections, giving it no neck. It basically became a giant head with two legs. <laughs> this sculpt by Tony McVeigh returned to those cartoony proportions again. And this captured the Muppet-like quality that we want. This is a really good example of the fine line that we constantly walk between cartoony and realism for the Mandalorian. Star Wars creatures are a perfect blend between the two. When you think of the space slug, or Jabba the Hutt, or any of the pod race aliens, the funkiness is what makes them memorable Star Wars characters. And even though the blur was going to be created digitally, John Favreau thought it might be fun to explore building it as a stop motion puppet, just as an experiment to go with old school. Maybe we could even film a shot or two of it, or at minimum, it would become a really good reference for our CGI, CGI work later on. So we decided to build a puppet, and this is the ball and socket armature in progress. This model is about eight inches tall, and here's the clay sculpt over that armature, and then the foam latex cast of that clay sculpt. And then finally, the finished painted stop motion puppet made of foam latex over that ball and socket armature. And we even made a tiny quill cool puppet to ride the blurg. <laughs> and to film this, we enlisted our friends at Stupid Buddy Studios, the robot chicken creators. <laughs> and they did some stop motion for it. Two, of these sh two shots of this puppet ended up in season one. And I won't tell you which ones, you'll have to find out. <laughs> At the end of season one, we want to stage this grand scene where Moff Gideon lands his TIE fighter in the Navarro courtyard. Now, there's been a lot of debate about how TIE fighters should land. To me, it never made sense that it would land on its wingstips. To me, it would have landing gears, and the wings would fold up like an airplane on an aircraft carrier. And there's been a lot of controversy. I stand by this design, even though I've gotten a lot of grief for it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, to me, this version just makes sense, and I was thrilled that John agreed. Plus, it just looks really cool. It looks like a menacing jet fighter insect. And this is how you would get in and out of the TIE fighter when it's landed on the ground. There are footholds built into the back of the ball, and they're the same kind of footholds that you would find on the side of a, of a fighter jet. And then you would climb up and through and go through the top like a tank. And we actually built a full size uh, ball and partial wings and landing gear for filming. Then the wings and the rest of the ship would be added digitally in post later on. This was built by one of our offsite contractors. And this was how it was wrapped when it was delivered to our stages <laughs> yeah, on a flatbed truck. I think any Star Wars fan seeing this driving down the 405 freeway would immediately know what it is. <laughs> For season two, we also wanted to design a new hidden base for Navarro. This was Moth Gideon's secret lab, built high on the cliff walls of the lava canyons. And I wanted to design the base so that it tied into our previous films. So we referenced the Idu base from Rogue One. And it made sense. Yeah. It made sense that the bases should look similar. Both were secret Imperial bases on remote planets conducting secret experiments. So here's our early version of that for Navarro. We kept the landing platform and the cylindrical architecture exactly the same, and those two elements connected it to Imperial construction for secret bases. And then the large cannons were added on top as an early idea, as a reference to the 1961 film, The Guns of Navarro. And this is a close-up of the landing platform and hangar. You'll notice that the control bridge is exactly the same as the light cruiser control bridge. Or, yeah, the bridge itself. This was deliberate for, uh, for both construction and budget purposes. This allowed us to use the same interior for both sets, and we just redressed and painted them differently. And this is the inside of the hangar. The fun part of this design was taking the classic Imperial hangar design and changing the material to be concrete instead of metal. It's always fun to take something that's familiar in our films and make it unfamiliar. And we even added the folding wing TIE fighter in here. And then during the climactic chase, our heroes escape in the Marauder transport. For those of you who grew up in the 1980s, the Marauder was based on this old Kenner toy. <laughs> yeah, yes. It was never seen in our films before, and it was strictly just a toy. But we thought it would be fun to bring it back and update it for season one. 
and it's briefly seen in our final episode. For season two, we decided to upgrade the design further and lose the side base for the trooper and add a real bar, rear ball turret. The turret was inspired by the tail gunner on a B-17 Flying Fortress bomber, but turned upside down. And this gave us a really fun opportunity to have a hanging gunner seat that swiveled. The juggernaut. Joe Johnston designed this original, originally as an assault vehicle for Hoth, when we saw a version of this on Kashyyyk in Revenge of the Sith. I've always loved this design, and we updated it for Rogue One. When we needed a new ground transport for season two for the planet of Morak, we thought we could create a smaller version of this for our jungle planet. Taking that idea, we scaled it down to be truck size. This was an interesting idea, but it wasn't unique enough. So we tried another version, where we made the wheels even bigger. This worked better, but it was still too ordinary. Then John said that he wanted to stage a fight sequence on the transport and asked for it to be more unstable. He said, you know, we want to do a fight like you're on top of a train to make it more chaotic. So Ryan took that idea and broke up the rear section into individual segments, giving each section a set of wheels. This was now fun and looking really unique. It became a land train, a centipede truck, where each segment could move independently. This is our hero CG model made by Rene Garcia. And like a train, we could add more segments if needed or remove the containers to create an articulating flatbed. Once the designs are approved, we start to develop and finalize the details for all the functionality that we would need for filming. So we had to figure out the full cab interior, the controls, the seats, how the doors work, how you would get in and out of it. And this is what we ended up building, just a full-size exterior and interior of the cab, plus a portion of the top for the stunt work and the blue sections were added in post. In this episode, the juggernaut transport uh, was carrying Rhydonium cargo to this ref imperial refinery. We designed the refinery based on an actual dam in Costa Rica. And grounding that refinery in a real dam made it look authentic. And in our story, since the facility was still under construction, we decided that it should have that familiar red construction from the Death Star 2. And it's a small detail, but it helps to make that visual connection to something that we've seen before in our films. Okay, let's talk about the crate Dragon. <laughs> this was one of our most interesting challenges for the, uh, season two. The dragon was first referenced in The New Hope as a skeleton in the desert. And it was originally meant to be just a cool background element detail. But then a whole mythology grew around it, along with a debate about what it should look like. Ralph McQuarrie did a version that was you know, on the left side for the illustrated Star Wars universe book. And then other interpretations were seen in our comic books. And all of them were really cool, and all of them were really different. Even Tara Whitlatch did a version for the, her Wildlife of Star Wars book. And all of them circled a common theme, but each of them con contradicted each other as well. One of the most interesting concepts, though, was that the dragon grew legs as it grew older, like antlers on a deer. And this helped explain why there are so many different versions, and it gave us license to design our own unique creature. While we were still filming season one, John gave me a verbal description of what he wanted. He wanted a crate dragon to be mysterious. We would never see its whole body. This was the first painting that I did for season two, where you see a giant creature underneath the sand. In this early concept, you can just make out the multiple legs of the sand. John compared it to the shark in Jaws, you know, where you only see the fin or the tail, while most of it is underwater. We would, but we would also see the head very clearly. And this was an early idea of having it burst out of the sand like an alligator loaching out of the water. For this version, I combined Ralph's head and mixed it with an alligator. And we also tried a version where it burst vertically out of the sand like a whale breaching out of the ocean. These were all interesting ideas and concepts, but the design itself wasn't working. And John encouraged us to depart from the, the previous interpretations and asked us to make it more mythological. And that was the key. He wanted us to be bolder. With that in mind, Christian combined different creatures to create our own chimera dragon, adding a triceratops horn shield, an alligator body, and a shark nose. And this started to work. It started to look really cool. The torpedo head made it look like it could push through sand. And it started to have the quality that John was looking for. It looked like a giant sand shark monster. And then we start to refine the head in clay to work it out practically. It's always helpful to sculpt 
physical maquettes. Even though we model in 3D in a lot of our design process, you can't replace having a physical sculpt because it's something that you can hold in front of you. And there's something very tangible about that to evaluate the design. This is the full body maquette. And you can see the shark head, the triceratops shield, the alligator body, tail, and legs. The rear legs we thought would be the more mature legs, and the smaller ones in the front were newer limbs. So as the creature grew, smaller legs would sprout from the front. Our mature dragon had eight pairs of legs, 16 altogether. And this version of the dragon was 150 feet long, even though the version that you see in our series is probably closer to 300 feet or more. For also for season two, we wanted to design a new ice planet. And this was really fun. You know, this is the planet where uh, Mando crash lands on. However, we discovered that anytime you design a ice or snow planet, it instantly becomes Hoth. <laughs> so we decided to distinguish it from the planet by making a glacial, you know, adding fissures and canyons. And we referenced the Icelandic glacier fields. And this gave us a really fun opportunity to have Mando flying through these vertical ice canyons to escape the X-Wing. And as we were designing it, the chase reminded me of the asteroid chase of the Falcon through the TIE Fighter in Empire Strikes Back. And I thought, well, how about if we design the landscape like an asteroid field from Empire Strikes Back, but taking that idea and turning it into ice? Antal Grandhart did this beautiful painting. It's not exactly one-to-one -one with the asteroid crater, but I like the similarities. And the call back to the fans, you know, I think it would just be a fun little Easter egg connection if they can get it. And speaking of Empire Strikes Back, I've always loved um, Ralph McQuarrie's swamp spiders from Dagobah. When we needed a creature on this planet, we thought, wouldn't it be fun to have these spiders on this ice planet? So we turned the swamp spiders into ice spiders. And Mando stumbles upon a whole layer of these creatures. Their white seems to be more fitting to this environment, too. This was an early painting by Christian where we tried to add more glowing red eyes to make it creepier. And we also explored the idea of making the monster mother super huge, the size of a kaiju. I mean, this would have been super fun, but we probably pushed it too far. <laughs> Once we get to the scale, it actually becomes another movie. <laughs> uh, for the book of Boba Fett, John wanted to return to Mos Espa from The Phantom Menace, and I love that idea. And I suggested that we go back to a part of Mos Espa that was designed and approved by George Lucas back in 1995, but was never seen. These were some of my sketches of Mos Espa back then. I'd always envisioned that Mos Espa was going to be a sunken city like Luke's homestead. And so for Book of Boba Fett, we did that. We put downtown Mos Espa in the sinkhole, and it worked really well. It was terrific to see Mos Espa finally as the way it was envisioned by George over 20 years ago. And the great thing about putting the city in the sinkhole is that it completely changed the horizon and gave it a new distinct look that's very different from Mos Eisley, even though all the architecture is pretty much the same. For the wide establishing shot, Anton took this location photo and painted over it. And this was quite successful. The sunken part is the old downtown district. And to the far right, off screen, would be Anakin's slave quarters that we saw in Phantom Menace. And then in the distance, where the pod race arena would be, is way on the horizon line. And you'll see Beggar's Canyon way out there, too. And speaking of pod racers. <laughs> John, <laughs> John wanted to give Cobb Vanth a unique speeder, something that he might have salvaged from a junkyard. And we thought, well, how about if we salvage the old pod racer engine that might have been refitted to be a speeder? And this was a really interesting idea, but most of the pod race engines were huge. And you can see here, we tried it with Saboba's engines, but it got ridiculously big. <laughs> Then we thought, OK, well, how about if we use Anakin's pod racer, which was based on a smaller F-15 fighter jet engine? Maybe Kyle Van bought one of those engines at a garage sale and added a sidecar. This worked. Even if we hadn't used Anakin's pod engine, this is a really cool idea for a speeder bike. But the fact that it's built around Anakin's made it even more special for fans who may recognize it. We kept Anakin's colors in the two front fins, and we matched all the details from the original. Okay. <laughs> okay. The Naboo Starfighter, the N1. Back in 1995, we took a huge chance on this design. George wanted an elegant starfighter, something that's the equivalent of an F-1 
racing car version of an X-Wing. This design was either going to be super cool or fail spectacularly. <laughs> Thankfully, it stood the test of time. So I was thrilled when John asked if we could somehow rework this ship to be Mando's new spaceship. And I loved that idea. <laughs> but at first, it was really hard to figure out how to make that work. The N1 is too elegant, and it's not Mando's style. But then we thought, well, maybe it's like a barn find by Kelly, like discovering an old vintage car in an old abandoned farm. This gave us the opportunity to rebuild it and make it new and unique for Mando. And I want to retain the automotive quality so we, to give it a real car-like chassis, since the original was designed to be handcrafted. We wanted the undercarriage to look like a piece of art underneath the exterior shell. Rene Garcia took on this task and stripped it down to his chassis and built this elegant framework. And then next, we start to add body panels, building up from the inside out. Then we added the mechanical guts of the ship, all the internal components. And then finally, we refurbished the outer skin, leaving it raw and unpainted. We left the front edge exposed to look like teeth and the side vents to look like gills. Then we souped up this ship by adding a third engine underneath the cockpit. And then we added superchargers to the side engines. This became our Star Wars version of a 1950s hot rod. And I have to say, this is now one of my favorite designs for the Mandalorian. <laughs> And speaking of favorite ships, uh, the Millennium Falcon and the X-Wing are definitely mine, favorite from the original trilogy, but Slave One is the all-time classic for me. <laughs> Ryan Church did this painting of an action beat that quickly became an iconic moment that I had to see. For the book of Boba Fett, we wanted to figure out how Slave One would actually work, how it would rotate, and what that meant inside. For, Mando, you know, for, for season two of Mando, we actually pitched the idea that the ship survived. Jabba kept it in his palace after Return of the Jedi. This concept wasn't used for season two, so we updated it for Book of Boba. In the scene here, Boba and Fennec are stealing it back. And so our biggest challenge was, you know, how do we figure out the interior? How do we make it work? In the prequels, we never saw the interior transition from horizontal to, to vertical flight. In the Attack of the Clones, we only built the partial cockpit. The cockpit pivoted on those two swing arms to stay upright like a self-riding gimbal. That worked okay if you were only seeing the cockpit, but it didn't really explain how the rest of the ship would work. And we wanted to see how the rest of the ship would work because we were gonna be down in the main hold. And we realized just having the cockpit rotate didn't make sense. So we decided to reverse the idea, keep the cockpit fixed and swivel the main hold instead. This of course created all kinds of design challenges. It was super tricky and complicated to figure out. So I gave it to Ryan Church to figure out. <laughs> and he did it beautifully. This is the main room, just underneath the cockpit. So the floor would stay level while the ship rotated around it. And as the ship rotated, the ladders and the access rooms would line up for the two different configurations. And as it rotated, the large front window would come into view. And that would create lighting changes to help sell the idea. Having figured it out conceptually, the next step was to figure out how to execute this practically. This would have been an incredibly expensive and difficult set to build practically. But using the LED screen, we could actually rotate the set virtually. And this became one of the best examples of how we use LED technology to pull off a complex set like this with minimal construction. In fact, the only thing we built was the floor, the seat, and some controls. The rest of the ship was virtual and projected onto our screens this is the animatic that shows how that virtual environment would work. All the movement you see would be virtual um, CG extensions that are projected, rendered real time. And then this, oh, it's pretty dark. But this is how the shot looked in, in the final shot. And all this was achieved in camera. You know, this is one of those great examples where our new technology is actually making this a very reasonable set for very low cost but with powerful visual impact. And here's a cross section of how it actually works how the ship would rotate around the main hold. I think Slave One is an amazing design, and I'm just glad that we finally had a chance to figure it out the inside and how it worked. Scorpionic droid. <laughs> this was another fun one. This was a fun idea that we brought back for the prequels for a book of Boba Fett. I originally designed this back in 2000 as the Annihilator droid for Attack of the Clones. It was meant to be the successor to the Destroyer droids. It was going to be bigger, badder, and badder. But unfortunately, we never used it. And I always liked the design, so I was really happy when John said, hey, let's try to use it for the pike at the end in the final episode. 
So Rene Garcia took that concept model and built this beautiful model, working on all the details to make sure that it actually works. I wanted to keep the metallic finish in the spider legs of the destroyer droid, but the scorpion neck is definitely a meaner version with the cyclops eyes. For personality, the guns were raised to shoulder height, and the gun belts were meant to look like flexed shoulder muscles. And here's an early keyframe from Anton of the scorpion neck laying siege to Garza's sanctuary. The guns were much bigger because, than the destroyer because these don't have to fold up. And then finally, I want to highlight one of the best aspects of working with John and Dave. During the first weeks of Boba Fett, John posed the question. He asked us, what would happen if a rancor got loose on Tatooine? <laughs> and it's one of those questions that- Don't worry, off in just a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. No, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Oof. Wow, you guys are too much. I just wanted to say, um, <clears throat> I can hardly speak after speaking to you all for the last two days, but I just wanted to say, I just wanted to come out and say thank you to you because um, I've never done a convention before. I've never been a celebration before. I didn't really know, I guess, what it was like. And um, what's been really amazing is to, is to be able to, when I'm signing autographs or taking photographs, is to be able to meet you, even though if it's just for a second. I just wanted you to know. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that it's meant something to me very special, and uh, I've loved every minute of it. And uh, so I wanted to say thank you. Huh? And I'll be back next year, yeah. yeah. I'm going to see some of you in uh, Edinburgh, and I'll see some of you in San Antonio as well, I think. But um, on another note, <clears throat> there's a, some people that have signed up for autographs who haven't come yet, and uh, I'm, I've got to leave soon, so I just wanted to give you the sort of a last chance. If you signed up and you haven't come to do it, I'm, I'm available for another 20 minutes or so, so come and get them, but listen, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was amazing watching the first two episodes with you the other night. I hope I hope you love episode three and then four and five and six and uh, seven and eight and nine and ten. Woo! We now return to the Doug Chang panel from Star Wars Celebration Live. Godzilla rampaging through the city. And we also envisioned a standoff between the Scorponek and the Rancor. And then we thought, well, Godzilla's cool. How about King Kong? And so Anton worked up this early concept of the Rancor climbing up a tower holding a tree like Fay Ray.
These last paintings demonstrate how we would often design and brainstorm ideas very early in the writing process. John and Dave gave us complete license to explore our wildest ideas, and it was our job to push it as far as we could. And not surprisingly, John would always push us further still. It was a beautiful synergy of art and words. This is what excites me about designing for the Mandalorian universe. It's always fun, fresh, and filled with unexpected surprises. And when you think about it, that's exactly what Star Wars design should be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Doug Ching, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Doug Ching. Thank you. If you have burning questions for Doug Chang, we are going to set a microphone up on this aisle and a microphone up on this aisle. If you don't get a chance to have your question answered or even ask it, please remember he'll be at the university stage from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. this evening. But why don't we go ahead and kick off some Q&A if you're ready. Yes. And we'll start uh, right over here if you're ready oh. with uh, Poe Dameron from Rise of Skywalker here. <laughs> hey, Doug. Hey. Nice to meet you. Um, so I noticed that you had different um, versions of traditional work, blueprint, and then um, photo bashing. At what point do you decide which approach you're going to take when designing something? Yeah, no, all of those techniques are available. And for us, it's really about you know, finding what's the best for inspiration. So I still do a lot of the initial concepts on a post-it paper, post-it note, just because I like the size of that. Other times, we'll do collages, old school collages, cutting apart photos. But you know, because Photoshop is so powerful now, you can just use that you know, as one sort of tool platform. But it's really all available to us, so it doesn't really matter. It's whatever inspires the artist. And as you'll know, if you attend the, uh, the next session of, uh, you know, where you'll meet some of the artists that created this beautiful artwork and design, we all have different backgrounds and different techniques. OK, cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure. Right here. Hi, Doug. Hey. My name is Skip Torvenen. And I had a question about that. Is it overwhelming with all the different properties now to design everything for all the shows that Lucasfilm and you know, Disney are coming out with? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, the past two years, it's been absolutely crazy, because we were literally doing four to five shows yeah. simultaneously. Uh, you're seeing all the results of that now, which is great. But honestly, the one thing that saves it is because it's all in the Star Wars universe, so there is a lot common language there. And it's all within the roughly the same time frame. And honestly, all the homework that um, George had us develop you know, back in the 90s, is, they're paying off. Because essentially, that laid the foundation for all design aesthetics. So I know, specifically, if he targets, if our shows target a specific time frame, I know the aesthetics that's going to ground that. So it really helps to have that foundation there. Mm -hmm. Right here. Sure. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you've shown us how you're informed by real world vehicles, and is there anything you've designed that you'd like to see come into our world? <laughs> yes. And one of those actually is you know, part of the, the campaign that you're seeing out there with the VW car and also our Porsche campaign. So we're starting to merge the two. And what I find fascinating about that is a lot of the film work that I do is really kind of blue sky. I mean, we really don't have to worry about practicality because we're designing stuff that only exists you know, on screen. What I appreciate from working with other design disciplines is that they're able to kind of come into our world and inform, you know, how do we make this more real? And so it becomes this beautiful collaboration. And one of the best examples of that is, you know, when we were working with um, Porsche last year, or two years ago, for Rise of Skywalker, the Pegasus spaceship, the Tri-Wing. That was a collaboration with a team where we worked with the Porsche team and our team to design the spaceship that exists in the Star Wars universe but can also exist in our real world. Right here. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Doug. Uh, I'm from the prequel generation of Star Wars fans, so all your designs for prequels <laughs> were really big inspiration for me. One of my favorites from those films is Obi-Wan's Jedi Starfighter in episode two. I was wondering if you could just talk about the design process for that show. Yeah. No, that was a really fun one. And it was really funny because you know when I was designing that, um, George just gave me a really short brief. And, and I didn't understand the history of where he was going. I didn't know at that time that he was going to imply that the Jedi and the Republic were becoming the Empire. And when he said, OK, I want a mini Star Destroyer as a Jedi ship. And I thought at first, I was like, wait, that's the wrong form language. <laughs> we're establishing something different. But he had a very specific reason. And he said, literally, just take the Star Destroyer triangle and turn it into a jet fighter. 
And you know, it works. And where he was going with it was he was really establishing, he was thinking big picture of the whole universe. And that's what I really appreciate is that, you know, as a designer, sometimes I get too focused on the little thing and I think that I know the rules. Only George knows the rules. And I'm trying to learn them. Yeah. So it's really great that, you know, there were those little nuggets that he kind of planted in there. And if you look at it, that goes across everything. Form language, shapes, materials, textures, colors. That's a wonderful question right here. Hi there, Doug. Hey. Uh, what I would love to know is what are some of the inspirations for you from film or real life that you find yourself going back to when it comes to generating ideas? Yeah, you know, for me, it's actually nature. I think nature is one of the best designers, of course. And I grew up, um, I originally wanted to be <laughs> a zoologist or <laughs> at minimum a wildlife painter because I just love that, combining nature. And if you see any of the early designs, there's a lot of animal influences in terms of what I do for mechanical design. And it's mainly because I like the personality that you get from it. But it's also, when you look at nature, there's a lot of elegance that we can derive from in terms of forms that we can change, you know, use for our spaceships. Uh, and the easiest equivalent is you look at our stealth fighters, you know, they're taken right out of birds, falcons, you know, in terms of the foreign language. And that makes a lot of sense. So I always kind of go back to that um, to sort of find that inspiration. And you're not literally translating nature into our world, but you're using it as a seed of sort of the foundation of the idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right here. Hello. My name is Cassie. Thanks for coming out Hello. here. Um, <laughs> My main question is about software that you use, or if you prefer more traditional art. And looking at each of the three stages of the Star Wars films, you can see there's neoclassical, renaissance, higher and low, medieval ages, and grunge from the 1990s. So how do you take all those different art and historical factors and put it into your traditional or digital work? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really good question. And that's where, you know, there's a good core group of Lucasfilm artists, and we all use different um, tools and, and that are available to us. Most of it is digital now. I mean, all of us come from a traditional background, so we all drew traditionally on pencil and paper. Um, I'm probably the oldest school of them because I don't have sort of the ability that these guys have in terms of working with software, sophisticated software. Um, but it's all there, and the great thing about it is that they are only tools. And the great thing about designing, whether in 2D or 3D or using traditional tools or you know, new software, is that we gather all the reference that we have. And honestly, our jobs are so much easier now because back in 95, when we were researching for The Phantom Menace and the prequels, we had, you know, George had a fantastic research library, but it was old school. Books and card, card catalogs to find what you wanted. And it took forever. Now we just Google it. You know, and so I think that actually allows us to find quicker material quickly, and then importing those images into the computer, we can actually mix different eras, classical eras, you know, modern eras and stuff, to really experiment. And the whole idea is really to make it more efficient, to generate ideas and throw out the bad ones quickly. Thank you, right here. Mm -hmm. Hey Doug, I'm Chris. Hi. Welcome. Uh, for us now being able to talk about The Mandalorian, mm -hmm. what influenced you guys to commit to Ahsoka Tano's age and her tendrils? <laughs> I'm sure that's a lot of controversy for y'all. Yeah, no, and that's a really good one because um, we're trying to be very respectful and having, of course, Dave Filoni guide us. You know, he's, he's the creator of it, so I always default to him. And it's one of the things that we're finding is that as we're bringing sort of, you know, whether it's Clone Wars or Rebels uh, or Resistance, or, you know, the animated designs, they're very stylized. Uh, and so Dave actually gave us a lot of license to improve on them if we're necessary. You know, so our default is always to pay great respect to what has been done already because the fans have grown in love with it. And we actually reverse think it so that we almost pretend like, okay, let's pretend that the animated version actually existed in the future, and now we're going back and we're designing the live action version of that that inspired the animated version. And so that connection then gives us that flexibility to kind of maybe improve on certain things here and there. The biggest challenge that we have with characters like Ahsoka is really the actors, actor comfort. You know, one of the things that we discovered is with her lacues, if we were to match the anime version, the actor couldn't perform well. You know, it just interfered with the, the stunts. And plus, it was too much that they couldn't hear and it affected their visibility. So we have to take all those things into consideration in live action to kind of factor that in. And it's a fine line. And honestly, it's, it's Dave's you know, baby who he actually sets those boundaries in terms of how far we can go. And it evolves. It evolves all the time because we bring and engage the actor as well. Say like, you know, 
Is this comfortable? Do you like it? Should we make this thinner? Do you need an earpiece in here? Should we make this thinner so you can actually hear without an earpiece? So there's a lot of different factors that goes in, and it becomes a very complex, you know, multi-dimensional you know, thing to solve these things. So it's not as simple as like, okay, here's the anime version, here's the live action version. Why does it not sync up? There's a lot of reasons why. Thank you. <laughs> wow, yeah. yeah, round of applause for that. I'm still reacting to that one. That's great. Right here. Hi, huge fan of all of this. I have a question. I've always loved the uh, Orson Welles quote, the absence of limitations is the enemy of art. But I wonder about the technology of limitation. Mm -hmm. There are certain things in Star Wars that can just float. Like the, the, the flight ships just take off, defy gravity, yeah. lift straight up, then they have jets to move forward. Mm -hmm. But they never explain what that is. That Why do some robots just float? But like R2-D2, for example, right. needs little rockets to right. float. Yeah. I mean, do, does that technology of hovering, which seems like a key part of all Star Wars technology, yeah. is that got a name? Do you talk about that stuff? <laughs> it's called cinematic reason. <laughs> 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 it's whatever, you know, when I was working with George, it was whatever he wanted. And, and it just made sense because, you know, that was our easiest go-to was like, okay, in order to make something Star Wars, just levitate it. But there were certain rules that we wanted because there are certain story reasons why things had to float and could not float at the same time. And so he didn't want to break those. And it's one of those things where we are really just kind of like, you know, we're trying to create a very thorough world, but we are living kind of in an artificial fantasy world where, you know, the rules don't have to be explained. And in some ways, I like the mystery of that where he doesn't explain, like, you know, why does Luke's speeder can just float outside when it's powered off? You know? <laughs> I don't know, and why does the Naboo Starfighter float? And why does the X-Wing need landing gears? You know, and in fact, the X-Wing is supposed to be, you know, later technology. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a great question. Right here. Um, I guess uh, my question was actually similar to the last person, but it's more about the translation into animation or like the reverse, like Fennec Shan, who is like, first introduced in The Mandalorian, then brought and made it into The Bad Batch. And then The Dark Saber, how that whole hilt was changed slightly for The Mandalorian, like the post credit scene and all that. I'm just curious more about, do you find it as like different, like a future interpretation or just like two, I, I guess, uh, similar things, just different yeah. times? No, we always start with the animated version. We always stay true to that. And then where the changes comes in would be either for stunt or for actor or for just, you know, reality purposes. You know, one of the things like for lightsabers, we always give the actors an opportunity to determine, you know, what is the diameter of it because they have to hold it and how can they perform with it. And so then that starts to inform the design. So we factor all those things in there to try to create that original design. But we always start with what the original inspiration is. And then we always try very hard to not deviate too far from that so it doesn't look like it's a completely new invention. And so it's, it's one of those tricky things where, you know, even though we're in this very fabricated world, it's a big collaboration. There, it's not just me or the directors deciding this. It's a whole team of people. You have the prop master, you have the fabricator, you have the actors, you have the cinematographer to you know, determine the material. So it's a whole team effort to kind of get the best results. And what you're seeing on screen is that. Thank you. Great question, right here. Thank you. Doug, I wanted to thank you. I've had your books since I was a kid, the art books for Star Wars, so it's so cool to get to see you in person. Um, what I wanted to ask is Ralph McQuarrie helped define the look of this universe, and now you've helped carry it forward. How much of a connection did you have to Ralph, and are there any of his designs that you haven't gotten to pull from that you would like to? Oh, yeah, always. I mean, that was one of the great things of, you know, working with George in 95 is, you know, uh, got to know Ralph, you know, and, and, and speak with him and kind of like really get into his mind in terms of, you know, what his process was. Uh, and it was terrific. I mean, he's such a gentle, modest person. He had no idea how talented he was. Uh, and one of the things that we have now is that, you know, we have a huge legacy of all of his designs. And I still go back to them all the time, you know, because we have to. I mean, honestly, Star Wars design is Ralph. It's not me. It's not anybody else. It's Ralph. It really is. You know, it's Ralph and George. You know, so between the two of them, it's, it, you can't replace that. And so the challenge for us moving forward is really to try to find that, you know, channel Ralph's energy. And Ralph didn't hit it 100% all the time. There are some designs that weren't quite Star Wars, and you'll see those kind of, you know, in the, in the art of books as well. But 99% of the time, he was there. I mean, he got it, and he nailed it. And so in the art department now, we always try to channel him. You know, so if we run into a... a a mental block of, okay, what is, this, what is this design? How can we improve on it? I mean, my go-to is pull out an old Ralph book and say, like, let's see how he would have solved this. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more right here. Hi, Doug. You're a legend, by the way. Oh. Um, I was two years old when The Phantom Menace came out, and uh, I was at the midnight showing, uh, <laughs> thanks to my parents. <laughs> but the N1 Starfighter is such an integral part to my experience growing up with Star Wars. And I know you already touched on it a little bit, but I'm a little bit curious on how it was revisiting your work from something like The Phantom Menace when you were working with George yeah. to now in a time where George isn't as involved, but paying respect to that design and, mm -hmm. and to your personal experience with it. Yeah, no, I have to say it's, it's um, the N1 is specifically is, is one of my favorite designs and for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, it was because George really pushed me out of my comfort zone. You know, by challenging myself and the other designers to create something that was new, something that was more elegant that actually tied it within the whole design workflow. For me, when I was designing it, I was really trying to like get outside of my comfort zone to design something that was going to be unique, and I had no idea if it would be successful. And thank God, you know, George was there to say like yes or no, you know, because I had to default to him. The sad part now is, of course, that responsibility falls on us and our team to try to determine, you know, where that line is. And I always try my best to kind of like take those seven years of George Lucas film and art school and channel that energy, and we try our best. And what I find is that, you know, when I was working with George in '95. The best ideas were the ones that were the most uncomfortable for me. The ones that I thought, oh man, we can't do this. And they turned out to be the best. You know, and so I use that as a little bit of a gauge. And it's not to say that we should just go out there and just throw all the design history away and try something completely off the wall. No, my job right now is to really try to push it as far as we can with that boundary. You know, and the N1 is a great example of that because it was a very unique design. I mean, people can tear it apart because it looks like a flying boat. And it was done that way because it was on Naboo and originally it was supposed to land in water. That's why it has a boat hull. And that's why we gave it no landing gears. <laughs> And then George gave it the bright yellow and the chrome because he wanted an F1, a racing car. You know, I could never have thought like, okay, you want to paint a Star Wars spaceship bright yellow? You know, how does that work? You know, but it now makes sense in terms of the whole timeline. So what I love about the Mandalorian is we're starting to make all those things make sense. We're making that cohesive universe that George had envisioned, and it's all there now. And now we're slowly getting an opportunity to bring all those designs, connect the dots to make it work. So having the N1 come back, refurbishing it, making a Mando ship was a really terrific example of that process. Thank yep. you for that. Last question right here. Hi, Doug. Hi. Uh, I'm Dylan. And I just wanted to ask, which of the five versions of the Mandalorian's armor is your favorite, and which piece of the armor is your favorite, other than the helmet? <laughs> the last one, and it's this helmet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. That's yeah, that was great. it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was great. Doug Chang, ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank you, you, Doug. All right. Thank you so much.